the very best of what America stands for, to uphold honor and democratic values that are the foundation of the strength of this nation. You know, I sometimes get criticized for saying what I deeply believe, having done this for the bulk of my life. We're in a, we're in a battle between democracies and autocracies. The more complicated the world becomes, the more difficult it is for democracies to come together and reach consensus. I've spent more time with President Xi of China than any world leader has for 24 hours of private meetings with him, with just an interpreter, 17,000 miles traveling with him in China and here. He firmly believes that China, before the year 3035, is going to own America because autocracies can make quick decisions. But America is unique. Of all nations in the world, we're the only nation organized based on an idea. Every other nation you can define by their ethnicity, their geography, their religion, except America. America is born out of an idea. We hold these truths to be self-evident, but all men and women are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, etc. None of you get your rights from your government. You get your rights merely because you're a child of God. The government is there to protect those God-given rights. No other government's been based on that notion. No one can defeat us except us. It's an idea that generation of patriots have fought and died for it and defend it. I know that's a conviction that each and every day you all share. That's why you joined up, why you run around danger and duty calls. It's my greatest honor should not surprise anybody, it should be anybody's greatest honor in all of life to be able to serve as your commander in chief. No greater honor. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for spending this time with me today. And thank you for your commitment to our country. Because without you, as I said, I'll be end where I began. You are the spine of America, the spine. I can't tell you how much it matters. I think you underestimate. It's the consequence of who you are and what you do. Well, thank you. May God bless you. And may God protect our troops. Thanks.
flash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The no Miki show. The No Miki Show. The No Miki Show. The No Miki Show.
Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from a leech, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed, everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system, unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue, talking heads left is best. The saga continues. continues. The No Miki Show. Uh. The No Miki Show.
No Mickey Show. The No Mickey Show. Yeah. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed, deep state, faith fed, everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system, unionize labor rights, highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues, continues. The No Miki Show. The No Miki Show.
momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The no Mickey show. The No Mickey Show. The No Mickey Show. Hello, welcome to the No Mickey Show. I'm No Mickey Const. It is May 28th, Fem Friday. That is today, our favorite day of the week. Uh, what's not great about today is that the dreams. <laughs> dreams of investigating, you know, the attempted coup, uh, you know, the attempted lynching of our vice president and who knows who else, uh, investigating that went down the tubes because Mitch McConnell doesn't want to have the light shown on his party because he's more obsessed with winning uh, back the Senate and Congress. Uh, yeah, this is the problem. The final vote at the end of the day was 54 to 35. You might be sitting there saying, hmm, that's weird. That doesn't that doesn't make up a hundred. How did that happen? Oh, people like Kirsten Cinema. Senator Kirsten Cinema did not want to block the vote. So she just didn't show up. She just didn't show up for the vote at all. She didn't have the nerve to curtsy and go with the rest of her Republican colleagues. Uh, yeah. But you know who did have a comment? The courageous leader of the Senate who just really has had it with the Republicans at this point. Senator Joe Manchin. Let's play that clip. This is the breaking news. While we were watching the president, we now know the tally is final. That effort to create a bipartisan independent commission investigating the, the attack that took place at the Capitol on January 6th has failed. It has been blocked. That means by a vote of 54 to 35 right now, uh, six Republicans joining all the Democrats there. There were not enough votes to advance that procedure. Among those six Republicans who voted in support of pursuing this path, they included Senator Romney, Ben Sass of Nebraska, Ohio's Senator Portman, Murkowski from Alaska, Collins from Maine, and Senator Cassidy from Louisiana, who is one of the senators who in the most recent impeachment trial of President Trump voted in support of impeachment. We're joined now again by our panel, and I want to get to the former Republican National Committee Chair Michael Steele on this. Michael, just want to get your immediate reaction to that vote. It seems like if Republicans can't join Democrats on something that all Americans witnessed, like the January 6th attack and investigating them, it's going to be hard to see any path for agreement going forward. And joining me now is NBC's chief White House correspondent, Kristen Welker. She is, of course, also the co anchor of Weekend Today. Uh, Kristen, uh, thanks for being here. Okay. I don't what know. have we have learned clip, just in the last. Um, this is a new clip. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, that came out wrong for some reason. We had a clip of Manchin, but uh, I don't know what happened with it. Um, so Joe Manchin was calling out his colleagues today. Day, his Republican colleagues, you know, the ones that he just yesterday wanted to have a bipartisan relationship with. He was calling them out for not being courageous, for not understanding. Uh, you know, Manchin said that he was increasingly he was increasingly upset with McConnell, saying his his actions are complicating, quote, quote complicating any chance we have to be part bipartisan. He said Mitch McConnell makes it extremely difficult Mitch is, I like to think, a person who understands the institution as well, if not better than anyone. He's making it so difficult on something as soon as this commission. The commission is something the country needs. He continues on saying, there's no excuse. It's just pure raw politics. And that's just so, so disheartening. It really, really is disheartening. I never thought I'd see it up close and personal that politics could trump our country. And, I, and I'm going to fight to save this country. That is what Senator Joe Manchin said. You know what would help save this country, Senator Joe Manchin? Ending the filibuster. Because that is what created this disaster. That is what created this disaster. And we need your vote. We need your courage to save this country by ending the filibuster. Because you can't on one day of the week say it's all the Republicans' fault. They don't want to go through this commission and heal this country and figure out what led to this, but on the other hand, not want to end the filibuster. And that is today's lesson. You can't have it both ways. Joe Manchin, you can't look good 
on one day of the week and bad on another. The in, he is right. The institution is the problem. And you can't be an institutionalist that has a filibuster and somehow think that you're going to cure these problems. All right, we have a wonderful show today. We have Kirsten Godsey, who's here to talk about why socialists have better sex. Ooh, I'm excited. Uh, it is, she's the author of Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence. And then later we have uh, Jamie Peck is back. Jamie Peck is back with the one and only Esperanza Fonseca. We're gonna talk about today's news. All right, we'll be right back after this break. Can you hear me? You're live. Hot mic. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. I am so excited uh, to be interviewing, again, I've done it before on the Michael Brooks Legacy Project, uh, Kristen Godsey. She is the author of Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence. She is a professor of Russian and East European studies, and she is the author of 10 books. My God, man, I don't know how you people do it. I can't even write a proposal. I'm just... <laughs> A proposal I'm writing right now, and it's like taking me forever. You are of a different breed, man. <laughs> I give you a lot of credit. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. So you're, it's so funny. We had you booked and uh, I was on a show the other day with Jamie Pack, who's on later. And we, you were the talk of the show because we, we, Jamie and I basically pulled this entire show of men and, and started talking about uh, sex lives under women and, uh, and, and, you know, many theories about how we want to uh, explore our independence, uh, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get to. But what inspired you to write this book? I mean, you know, so it's a strange sort of story. I've been doing research on women's rights in Eastern Europe for the better part of 25 years. So what happened is just, you know, as with many of us academics who kind of toil in obscurity in weird Bulgarian archives, um, the centennial of the Russian Revolution was happening in 2017, and the New York Times was doing a series called Red Century, which was reflecting on the legacies of 1917. And as part of that series, I just had a book come out called Red Hangover. And one of the chapters of that book was literally called Gross Domestic Orgasms, and it was about sort of East-West debates over which economic system would give people more pleasure in the bedroom. And it was it was sort of reflecting on a documentary film that I had shown in West Germany and kind of the West German reaction. Anyway, the op-ed in the New York Times, you know, blew up in my face, like went viral beyond anybody's uh, expectations. And, and then suddenly, you know, I got a call from a New York publisher and they said, hey, you wanna write a book? <laughs> so that's what happened. How is it that you can measure whether or not somebody has better sex. Let's just start with that because, you know, it, it, it's one thing to actually have better sex. It's another thing to discuss it and to be open about it. Can you, right. be, can you be a Puritan and have good sex, but just not talk about it? That kind of situation? 
Yeah, I mean, sure. Look, all sexual um, satisfaction data is inevitably going to be self-reported. I mean, unless you're putting people in labs, right? And right. <laughs> you're actually, <laughs> you're doing- Which has been done too. <laughs> yes, it has been done. That's what I'm saying. So, um, but I think that the, the, the key thing that this, the study that sort of inspired the, the op-ed and ultimately the book was this comparison of East German and West German women before 1989 when the Berlin Wall, Wall fell and after 1989. And they asked women a, a series of questions. Um, it, actually, they asked both men and women. And sometimes they were euphemistic questions like, did your last sexual encounter make you feel happy? Um, and, and sometimes they were very specific, like, did your last sexual encounter leave you satisfied, which is a much more specific sort of um, answer. And look, those studies were replicated before 89 and after 89, and they asked East German women and West German women the exact same questions. And it turns out that at least in terms of self-reported sexual satisfaction, women who grew up under state socialism were reporting just much higher rates of orgasm and much higher rates of like happiness after their sexual encounters than West German women. And, um, and I think like that was the sort of the jumping off point for a lot of this research was like, well, why would that be? I'm going to guess, yeah. <laughs> but let's, 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 I'm sure the audience could guess, uh, but let's explore it a little bit. What, what are some of the, the root causes um, or why is it that socialism creates the dynamics for uh, better sex for women in particular, which actually how, before we even get to that, there's just so much here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a big fan <laughs> of the book. So I'm like <laughs> getting into the psychology of a woman. Like what is it that makes better sex before we even get to the economic conditions that might facilitate better sex, what are some of the things that help a woman uh, orgasm more? <laughs> well, the, it's the new know, terrain so, for us on the show, just so you know. Yeah, no, right. So the, the thing that's really interesting is that even that question is vexed by political and economic systems, right? So in the West, we generally tend to kind of follow the four stage sexual response theory of Masters and Johnson, which is that it's like the kind of the right sort of stimulation and in absence of the right kind of stimulation, you're, you know, you can't have the kind of um, sexual enjoyment that, that you would have if your partner, let's say, knew what he or she were doing um, or they were doing. But, but I think that in the, in the Eastern Bloc, and I have a, a wonderful colleague, Agnieszka Kozianska in Poland, who has written an entire book on Polish sexology before 1989, they looked at sexuality in a much more holistic way. So they thought like, if you're stressed, if you're tired, if you're worried about paying the bills, if you don't have anybody to look after your kids, if you don't have privacy, if you don't have a sense of yourself as an independent person, it doesn't matter if like, you know, the perfect with the person, perfect um, stimulation technique walks into your life, it's not going to help, right? Women are much more complicated in this particular way. And so I feel like the socialist countries had a very different sense of sexology and what kinds of practices and techniques and psychological frameworks, social frameworks were responsible for people's individual happiness. And of course, sexual satisfaction is a proxy ultimately in these debates for relationship satisfaction. So they're talking about sex, but they're really meaning a much broader set of factors. And I do think that like, there is no one definition of what is going to be the right sort of technique for anybody. But even the way that that question is framed, I think is very different in a capitalist versus a socialist uh, economy precisely because in capitalism sexual quote unquote dysfunction or any sort of sexual issue is a is a profit incentive it's a it's a question that needs a pill or needs a very expensive set of therapeutic interventions whereas in the socialist um, system where you had sort of state funded sexologists it wasn't a profit incentive. It wasn't a profit center. It was a place where the state sort of said, hey, look, let's actually take care of people and create the conditions for them to have healthier and happier and more satisfying relationships. 
what inspired uh, these socialist countries, and, and, and please feel free to get specific if you'd like, um, to invest in that? Like, it, it, it's, it seems, if, unless there's, I understand the profit motive side of it, but it, I, I can't imagine a Bernie Sanders government. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think Bernie Sanders is thinking about that. Not that you know, it's a No, social. you know, yeah, that's a good point. So I think, you know, again, without not, I don't want to go into like all of the deep details, but like even as early as the late 19th century with writers like August Babel and eventually people like Alexander Kolontai, August Babel was writing in Germany. Kolontai was writing in the Soviet Union prior she was writing in Russia. Um, there was this sense that women who were economically dependent on their husbands um, were were oppressed, right? There was there was no power in that relationship, and the the imbalance in that relationship meant that women became a commodity. That women's bodies became a particular kind of commodity on a marriage market, and so very early socialist theorists in Europe sort of thought if we get rid of private property, if we socialize the means of production, women will be these incredibly beneficial, incredible beneficiaries of this project because they'll have much more autonomy in their own choice of partners and they won't have to worry about marrying for money or you know, marrying somebody to, in order to just keep a roof over, roof over their head or to have a, you know, their children fed or whatever. So, so all of that language existed before the Soviet Union even became into being, right? Those ideas were floating around. August Babel very specifically talks about women being free to choose sexual partners. This is like in 1879, like the Victorian era. I mean, it's pretty radical stuff. Colin Ty talks about, you know, winged eros versus wingless eros and comradely love. And the Soviet Union in 1926, like they have a, a very um, incendiary film, uh, the, 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 the name um, in Russian was the love of three, which literally translates to menage a trois. And it's one woman living with two husbands, right? So Sounds they were- like torment. <laughs> I know, thank you. Real, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and the, at the end of the film, the woman leaves both of the husbands, which is great, right? Um, but, but what I'm saying is, is that there was a lot of early theorization around this question. And so eventually it people, government leaders, partially because they were in a conversation with women's committees in these countries, they just said, look, like we have all these sort of negatives of our, of our economies. We have these stupid centrally planned economies. We have consumer shortages. We have travel restrictions. We have housing shortages, right? There, there are real problems. And um, the uh, historian Dagmar Herzog beautifully puts it. Um, the East German government said, sex, yes, travel, no, right? <laughs> so sex and good sex and good relationships with your fellow citizens and comrades was sort of in some ways a compensatory move to make up for the fact that you couldn't get jeans and you couldn't get perfume and you couldn't get skateboards, right? So you know, you, you, you get to choose was sort of the idea. And, and juxtapose that with the last year, uh, just to put into modern context in, in the United States in particular, um, there's been a rise in domestic violence rates and abuse and uh, femicides uh, across the world. Um, I'm sitting in Puerto Rico right now. It's the, the, the North American capital of femicides. And, you know, there's been enough research to intrinsically tie it to just the effects, the financial effects of the pandemic, people being forced to stay home, but also not being financially able to leave their partnerships in the same house. So it's it just it seems like a perfect example of how capitalism doesn't just lead to bad, it's not sex, it's bad relationships if you're gonna intrinsically exactly. tie them together. Look, you know, what we've seen in the last year is hundreds of thousands of women have had to leave the labor force because yep. schools are closed, kindergartens are closed, right? People um, cannot do the work-family balance. Like capitalism's backup plan is women's unpaid labor in the home. Let's just face it, right? Men do some of it too, right? But, but for the vast majority, we've seen the statistics in the last year, it clearly devolves onto the shoulders of women because women are expected to do this kind of care work. And um, yes, when women do not have economic independence, they cannot leave otherwise abusive, 
unhealthy or otherwise unhappy relationships. And that's in many ways what's driving this, this um, situation with domestic violence. But also, look, the Kaiser Family Foundation a couple of years ago basically found that one in four women under the age of 65 gets her health insurance through her spouse. So if you live in a country where there is no universal health care and there's a pandemic going on, it doesn't matter if your husband is pummeling you, you're not going to leave that relationship because if you get sick, what are you going to do? Or if your child gets sick, what are you going to do? So yes, I mean, the, the, the kinds of things that August Babel was talking about in 1879 or Kolontai was writing about in the 20s, they're very pertinent to the world today. So interesting. And so simultaneously, there's been this conversation. Um, I mean, it's come up personally. And and for me, I I have basically made the decision uh, to just not bye bye men don't need it. <laughs> just just decided, uh, you know, if you come in great, if not, but I'm not like tying my ovaries to a man. I if I have a child it's going to be on my terms with me. And that's my situation. I haven't said that publicly on a show. But so there's, there's been a lot more um, conversation around, you know, single parenthood, if you can afford to do so, if you are in a position where that is doable. At the same time, there have been, I think in the last year, at least two or three articles, The Atlantic, The New York Times had one just last week about how people are choosing to live with their best friends instead of their partners or, or potentially their partners to raise children. And I have had that conversation with my best friend who I'm a heterosexual woman, so is she, but we just realized we get along a lot better. <laughs> yeah. And, and so we're, it, it's, it's essentially that argument minus the socialism. It's, it's self-imposed, you know, some of the self-imposed solutions, I guess. Is this, does it seem to be like a, like a, it, it, does it seem like people are kind of taking it into their own hands and it's, and I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, it, like some of the themes that have come out of socialist countries, but individually. Right. So, I mean, so there's a couple of things that you're talking about. So in the, it, it, you know, in the first case, there is actually a massive decline in the birth rate. Thought that there was going to be all this big COVID baby boom. It did not happen. It will not happen. Right. People are not willing to have babies in any economic situation, which is so precarious. And that's just rational economic choice um, because the state doesn't step up and support what is ultimately a value to all of society because individual families are creating the next generation of consumers and taxpayers and, um, workers, right? So, so all the, the costs are completely private, but the benefits are ultimately public. So of course people are going to be like, this is a bad deal, right? We live in a capitalist society. People value, they do their cost benefit analysis and they realize that children are really hard because they're so expensive and we have so little support. I have a daughter in college. I can tell you how expensive it is, right? So, but, but the thing that you're talking about, like this idea of, of raising children outside of the heterosexual bourgeois monogamous family, look, that discussion has been had again, all the way um, back to Plato's Republic, right? People have been contemplating alternative ways of bringing family into the world that is not reliant on a particular sort of constellation of heteronormative relationships. And I think that that's what's happening right now is that capitalism has failed families. Capitalism has failed women in particular. Um, and, and I think that people are starting to think outside of the box of the nuclear family. They're starting to they're 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 starting to think outside of the box of the sort of monogamous family, and they're also starting to think outside the box of the romantic relationships. As you said, why not raise your children in common with a group of women that you really like, right? I mean, why is that such a weird um, possibility? Well, it turns out it's because we have laws about a uh, single family occupancy. There are all sorts of weird ways in which it's difficult. Tax incentives. Tax incentives, exactly. I mean, marriage equality is a new thing. So some of these things are, are just forming. So it's been encoded in, into our legal system, the nuclear family, which oh, is a new idea. It's, I mean, I mean fairly new. relatively new. No, relatively look, new. the nuclear family, the nuclear family goes back to 
Rome. I mean, it goes back to ancient Greece. I mean, Plato is railing against the nuclear family in ancient Greece when he's talking about the, his guardians having their wives and their property and their children in common. So this is a long standing critique. It's not, I mean, you know, against this sort of particular kind of um, formation of a patriarch with his wife or wives and children. And let, we think about the word, you know, family, familia, it actually um, denoted a much wider group of people that in included like the servants and the slaves of the patriarch. So, so there's a longer history of this critique, but I think that what's happening is that kind of ironically, the very people, especially in the US context, but this is true elsewhere as well, the very people who sort of uphold the family, the kind of nuclear monogamous heterosexual family as an ideal, also happen to be the people who uphold capitalism and free markets as an ideal. And it turns out that those kinds of things are a little bit orthogonal to each other. Like if you're a rational economic actor in a free market economy and children, if you bring them into the world are going to make it very difficult for you to um, you know, have a job and actually pay your rent or pay your health insurance, all of the things that are commodified in the United States, for instance, then what is going to happen is that it's not a conspiracy. It's just individual women are going to make the decision to not have children. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And this is an outcome like any economist looking at free market economic incentives would say this is a rational economic decision, right? Um, unfortunately, it means that in the future, uh, if, if you think about two thirds of the American economy being driven by consumption um, and the fact that we have this large, you know, retiring baby boomer generation that requires, you know, um, an active workforce to service the social security payments, economically in the long run, this is a real problem for, um, for the kind of conservative people in this country who think that the family family, you know, quote unquote, family values, their version of family values are the most important thing. And that, and, and at the same time, believe that free markets are the best way to run an economy. Those two things are going to ultimately come into conflict with each other. So I have related to that in, in socialist countries, did they find that men behaved differently? I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to kind of obviously analyze, but in terms of, of, I mean, so much of, of how even, you know, just, just on a personal level, like you don't even realize how much you are adapting to the nuclear family culture and the, and, and, you know, obviously there's different cultures that you can, your backgrounds too. I mean, I'm Greek, so we're, we're very much, much more traditional, but um, just as an American, like there's, there's a way of dating that has just become so entrenched, it's, it's entrenched in our culture that I believe is rooted in having this nuclear family structure and, and, our, and our political system or economic system. So how does that relate in, how do, how do men, yeah. so, <laughs> how so, do men so, date in a socialist, you know, country? So there's, yeah. there's a kind of a positive answer and a negative answer, I would say. Um, so the, the, the negative answer, I'll start with the bad news. So the negative answer is that men felt, you know, men have expressed, and I, I talk about this in the book, that they have much more power in a capitalist society in a relationship with women than they did in the old socialist society. Because in their old socialist society, they're, no matter how wealthy they were, um, it didn't really make a difference with women, right? Because women that's a could, bad answer. I'm sorry, what? For them, like for them dream. it was, right? Like they have a like, lot. Yes, they, the patriarchy is the capitalism. I'm so sorry right. that you just figured this out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so, and, and I think it's also really worth pointing out here that in all of these East European countries, with very few exceptions, there are a few exceptions, but with very few exceptions, patriarchy did persist. So there was still very much a gender division of labor. Men didn't really want to help out around the house. You know, men still had this kind of machismo issue. So, so those things, um, there was this, what was called the double burden. Women were responsible for both working outside the home and taking care of the kids and taking care of the house. So, so that never really went away. I mean, the way that the, the state 
tried to deal with this was by socializing as much housework as possible through public cafeterias and public laundries and canteens and kindergartens and creches and all these things that sort of tried to alleviate women's domestic responsibilities by socializing them rather than by getting them to be equally shared between men and women. So that's important. That's like the bad news. But the good news is that it's really important to realize that at least in Eastern Europe, exempting the Soviet Union, socialism only had about four years. And, and we can actually look at the Scandinavian countries, the sort of social democratic countries in Scandinavia, where um, a lot of these kinds of policies have persisted. And it turns out that if women have economic independence, and if women are able to make their own decisions in life, men behave better, because it's much easier for a woman to walk away from a relationship that is unsatisfying to her. And men are not stupid, right? They understand, you know, they respond to, again, signals. Um, and so I do think that we have very good evidence that shows that in, there was a longitudinal study of couples in Germany that had been together for five years of more, uh, five years or more with children. And in couples where the perceived distribution of childcare was more equitable, they had more sex, not better sex, but more, they had sex more often, right? Um, and since East German men were more likely to help around, out around the house more often than West German men, it turns out that it looked like couples with an East German man were more likely to be having sex more frequently. So, so there are these very, very specific empirical studies, but even within East Germany, there was a study that was done like 12 years apart. And in the first uh, study, they asked, you know, men, does women's, un women's paid employment affect, negatively affect the family? And in, I think it was like 1972, I can't remember the exact year, but in the first year it was 37% of men said, 8% of men. So, so attitudes do change. And I think it's really important to understand that when women have more economic independence in a relationship, it's also a huge benefit to men who don't feel like they have all of this pressure to be a provider in the relationship, right? And, and again, I think that's, that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that patriarchy is very deleterious to men too. And many men feel very boxed in by the responsibilities and the expectations that they face on the dating market. So yes, as you say, there's a particular way of dating under capitalism and it's bad for women, but I actually think it's bad for everyone, including men. So um, before you wrap up, because unfortunately we have a panel, but they're going to react to your <laughs> to your thoughts. But how does this relate to power, political power? Is do the dynamics? I mean, men still have testosterone, uh, and and I'm curious, like how how the bio biological effects play out in in political power. Um, I know that there was only four years in Eastern Europe under socialism, but uh, does it does does did it did it transcend upwardly into power? Because it seems like, you know, many of these decisions that were being made were, were, were by political figures. Um, so were they women? Were they men? So where were so they getting the question? So I think the, the honest answer is that no, it, um, women did not move into high positions of political power. Again, we had 70 years in the Soviet Union. You had 40 years in Eastern Europe. Uh, there were some exceptions. There were important prominent women on the Politburos in places like Bulgaria and very late in the Soviet Union. Um, you also had some very important uh, female, you know, political figures in like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There were many female ambassadors. Colin Tai was one of them back in the 20s. Um, so there were some exceptions. And, and the thing that's interesting is that a lot of these policies were actually implemented by men um, because... First of all, they were ideologically built into the socialist dogma. That's the first thing. Second of all, they really needed women's labor. Third of all, they really needed women to have babies and work at the same time. And they figured out that these policies, if you did, with the exception of places like Romania and Albania, where there was a very strict law against abortions, all of these countries maintained reproductive rights. So even though they were very pronatalist and they put a lot of pressure on women to have babies, they they definitely um, wanted to support women through things like kindergartens and crushes and really long 
job protected paid parental leaves, which are amazing in this part of the world and, and actually end up influencing policies in places like Scandinavia or in France or wherever. But, um, but it is, yeah, it is, were, there, there were very influential women like Alexandra Kollontai, who was the Commissar of Social Welfare between 1917 and 1920, uh, very Im influential figure who put in a lot of these early policies. There were women's committees. Again, they were more or less powerful depending on where you were. The Bulgarian Women's Committee was incredibly powerful. The Czechoslovak Women's Committee, not so much. Um, the Soviet Women's Committee, not so much. So it really depended on where you were, but there was pressure. And, and, and here's the most important thing is that, at least from my perspective, as somebody who's been doing this research in this part of the world for you know, 25 years or more, is that because women's emancipation was boiled in to the original ideas of socialism, starting in like the middle of the 19th century, even with people like Marx and Engels, right? With the origin of um, the family, private property and the state, Engels has a very clear critique of capitalism and capitalism's oppression of women and what is needed to be done to fix that. If you, um, if you think about that, what happened in Eastern Europe was that women held men in power accountable to their theoretical um, progenitors, right? So these guys, like anytime that women wanted to make a claim for more kindergartens or the better distribution of children's toys or better schools, they would say, Engels said so, Lenin said so, in Bulgaria, Georgi Dimitrov said so, right? So they were able to point, or Kolontai said so, they, they generally tended to point to the men and they sort of guilted men in power into basically living up to the ideals of their ideology. And I think that was so strategically effective, even if the women themselves didn't have the kind of power with the exception of people like Kolontai that really affected this change in the long run, they were able very strategically to work within the structures of power in these countries by appealing to these particular theoretical ideas from the 19th century, as I said, the kind of core text of socialism in order to promote not only women's economic independence, but the idea that people are happier and more satisfied when they live in a more egalitarian society writ large, not only between the gender, but between class and race, sexuality, and any other categories of difference. I love this conversation. I, I feel like you're taking me to church right now. Not, not theoretical church, I should say. Um, Kristen Godsey, thank you so much. Everybody go check out her book. Um, she's written 10 books, but this is a very important book. And just so you know, Kristen, um, I on Fridays, we talk about, we have anybody who identifies as a woman on the show. Uh, and we talk about women's issues, related issues, because the majority of <laughs> political YouTube is overwhelmingly male. <laughs> so yeah. it's important to have these conversations in these spaces and the chat is loving it. And that's a really important thing. So thank you so much. Uh, you can go check out Kristen Godsey's book, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence. It's, a bold, it's at Bold Type Books. Uh, go buy it anywhere where you buy books that is not Amazon or some you know god awful uh, company. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. Hope to have you back bookshop. on. Bookshop.org, right? Bookshop.org Shop. Bookshop. Bookshop. is supporting independent bookstores. So that's a Perfect. great place to go for any of your books. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much. Have a great, great afternoon. It was lovely. You too. Day. Same here. All right, guys. Uh, I have to talk about my favorite product, which you all know, which is Sunset Lake CBD. Uh, Sunset Lake CBD is something I use regularly, like daily in many different forms. Uh, it is a farmer owned company that ships craft CBD products directly from their farm in Vermont to your door. A farm that used to be a Ben and Jerry's farm, but they decided to diversify and grow premium hemp. And now they have all sorts of products. Uh, they have tinctures, gummies, salves, coffee, lotions, uh, what am I missing? Fudge, I've had uh, the dog biscuits, of course, that anybody can eat made of peanut butter, pumpkin, and oat flour. Not only are they a progressive owned farm uh, that is distributing and, and creating CBD products, but they are 
they they pay their minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour, and their their employees own the majority of their company. So when you're supporting them, you are supporting meaningful employment in rural communities, which is so important because we know our government has ignored rural communities. Um, and on top of it, they support shows like ours, The Majority Report, and of course, The David Pakman Show. Uh, I am, I don't know if Dorsey wants to show. Oh, whoa, whoa, what is this, man? You are all in. I'm the celebrating York- early. Gonna watch the, uh, the Knicks game tonight, so very excited. The Knicks game? Uh, they're playing the Atlanta Hawks in the first round of the playoffs, game three. Didn't they just play a game like two nights ago? Yeah, I was at that game. It was awesome. <laughs> anyway, these are my uh, Sunset <laughs> Lake pre-roll cherry and biscuits. So, they're so good. When I get a migraine, I just take like two two whiffs of that, two whiffs, two puffs yeah, I'm of trying that. To, I'm trying to ease myself into the game. Just like, okay, I got to be chill. Oh, my God. This is – I love this, Dorsey. Can we get this on repeat? When you Remember when Rick uh, – Rick Unger was was vaping and you just had it on repeat. I need it. That's what we need. Dorsey smoking some Sunset Lake CBD. All right, everybody. I'm you watched repeat. him do it. I had a tincture earlier today because I was like, <gasps> ball of stress. This is, I take the tincture and now I just drop it in my mouth. Oh, Brad's like, Dorsey gif now, please. I agree. I agree. All right. You too can buy Sunset Lake CBD products. Go to sunsetlakecbd.com and you will get 20% off of your order if you type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, sunsetlakecbd.com. Type in Nomi and we will be right back in two seconds with our, oh no, they're here. Okay, we're not even gonna take a break because we're running so late guys. Uh, that was such a fascinating conversation. So it was it was worth it. Jamie, Jamie Peck, of course, is the host of, co-host of The Antifada. Uh, and she has written for so many different places. Uh, of course, she was a former producer and contributor to the Majority Report. Uh, and just the other day we were on air talking about Kristen Godsey and I didn't realize that we had her on this week and it just cosmically came together that you're also on the same show so we can continue our conversation about what we were talking about yeah Esperanza Fonseca is of course a a member of a firm she's a labor and policy uh, organizer a firm is a transnational feminist organization uh, and she's been doing organizing for you know better part of a decade Esperanza you look lovely with the background I, I love it Thank you. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. So I know we have a lot of stuff that we want to talk about, but I want to start off with, um, I really want to start off with just, just this conversation about what we were talking about, Jamie, because I've sent you like 16 articles now and you're like, stop with the articles talking about how you're moving in with your best friend and giving up on relationships. So let's, let's get, I, I said it earlier on the show that I, my best friend and I are seriously having a conversation, except she lives in Switzerland. So it's a little bit um, complicated, but we're having a conversation about moving in together and just being, you know, partners, non-sexual partners and just raising children together. And men can come in and out, whatever, who cares? Just, I don't know, there's nothing attached to it, but you are having the same conversation as well, Jamie. And I'd love to hear your thoughts, Esperanza. What is it, what's, what's the theory? How did you get there, Jamie? How did I get there? Well, how I got there was, I realized that I wanna have at least one kid before I can't anymore. And, you know, I'm not opposed to adoption, but I feel like if I still have some good eggs, I should just do it myself. And uh, I actually just broke up with a really great guy because he does not want to have kids in the foreseeable future. And it was very sad. And I was like, well, you know what? What if I could unlink these two things from each other? And I was talking about it with my best friend because I was like, ugh all this fucking pressure to like find a man to procreate with before our eggs get old is like really stressful and annoying. And like, I don't know if I'm going to have my relation, my next relationship last forever. None of my relationships before now have lasted forever. Uh, But my relationship with my best friend is like pretty, pretty solid. Like we've been friends for like more than 10 years. I don't see anything changing uh, in that, in that arena. So like, I don't know. I feel like every time we talk about it, we get a little more serious about it. And I was just in Rhode Island uh, visiting her and she told me previously, she was like, oh, yeah, um, you can you can use my brother's uh, my brother's sperm to get yourself pregnant. And I was like, OK, well, have you talked Does to your brother about that? <laughs> exactly. yeah. And she was like, yeah, he's down. He's very practical. He's like, oh, Jamie's really smart. That sounds like a good idea. I was like, oh, that's so sweet. So like 
I was in Rhode Island and we were like over at her brother's house, like getting stoned and watching uh, 30 Days of Night on DVD because he doesn't have Internet at, at his house. And like I was just I was I was like, should we talk about this? And I was like, no, I'm way too stoned to talk about this right now. But I feel like I was thinking about it and he was thinking about it and wondering, is this actually going to happen? I don't know. But like there are so many barriers to doing it, even within my own, you know, very, I like to think of myself as an enlightened person. Like there's just this enormous cultural pressure to have a child, the quote unquote normal way, you know, with a, a two people, I guess, you know, we've made some progress. Like it's acceptable for gay people to have kids too now, but like, it's still you know like that kind of cracked people. open this conversation though. I feel like, you know, I don't, Dorsey, there's a, a, an article in our rundown um, from the New York Times talking about this just a few days ago. This is eight, eight days ago. This was published in the New York Times about how people are marrying their best friends. And then they kind of go through all the different scenarios, why they're marrying their best friends. Um, but I feel like this cracked open with marriage equality, like at least in a public way. I, I don't think there's anything. And they say this in the piece that it's obviously not a new, new concept to live with your best friend or be in some sort of partnership, domestic partnership. But there's tax. I mean, part of this is because marriage, which ties back to the bigger question, which is the nuclear family being a tool of capitalism in that there's tax incentives if you're in a traditional marriage. There's all sorts. There's housing. So Esperanza, you know, what, what are your thoughts on uh I'm just going to steal from Kenzo's show. Sorry, Kenzo. I know you're watching right now. What are your thoughts on the nuclear family since we're there? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, you know, I think that the nuclear family is a sort of basic economic unit under capitalism. I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with it. Um, I personally, you know, am monogamous. Uh, that's what I prefer. Uh, but I also think that, you know, we should understand that when we talk about the need to move beyond the, the nuclear family, it's not that, you know, two people or one man and one woman or two people of the same gender shouldn't, you know, be able to live together and start a family, but it's that uh, it shouldn't be a necessary basic economic unit. So like childcare, for example, should be collectivized. Like women should have economic independence so that they don't have to depend on men, um, you know, things, things like that. So I, I think we should change the underlying conditions so that uh, the, the nuclear family is no longer like the basic mandatory economic unit. What are your thoughts, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. And that's a lot of what I talk about when I talk about abolishing the family, right? Like, why are we thinking of having kids with our best friends? It's because it's a lot of fucking work yeah. and you shouldn't have to do it by yourself. And two people shouldn't have to do it by themselves. Like, I would like to see a world where all of society is collectively responsible for the children, where the work of creating human life and human beings is uh, spread out in a more fair and equal way so that it's not just women and, you know, especially women of color doing a disproportionate amount of the social reproductive labor in this world. Um, I want to see a world where everyone is cared for, no matter who they are sleeping with, no matter who they've been lucky enough to have been born to. Um, I also think the nuclear family uh, has a lot, a, a lot of problems. Like there is a, so much abuse concealed within the realm of this, you know, this is privacy. It's a family matter. And um, we heard right. Joe Biden yeah. talking about it. Uh, maybe we talked about this already, like uh, reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act, saying that domestic violence should not be a private matter. Uh, it should be, I guess, a matter for the carceral state. And I'm like, no, hey, guess what? There's a third option here where it is the responsibility of all of society to protect children, women, every human being from uh, intimate abuse, um, but not through uh, laws and prisons and police, right? Through like transformative justice and community accountability that actually helps keep people safe. So that's like another huge reason for me why I think we need to abolish the family. And simultaneously, it would be really nice if Joe Biden would talk about things like housing and wages, which are not always directly correlated, but you know, how many, we talked about this earlier, just how many, how much domestic violence has taken place because people do not feel comfortable leaving their situation because they have to provide for their children because they don't have the economic uh, circumstances to be able to leave the, ho or housing. I mean, I, I know I personally experienced that, you know, a decade ago and, and I am, 
I have way more privilege than most people. So um, it would be really nice if Joe Biden like could connect those dots a little bit too. be lovely. Of course not. Of course not. Esperanza, go ahead. Yeah, and I know that the guest that was on earlier brought up Kolontai. And, you know, if you read Kolontai, she talks about how during her time, the feminists were fighting the institution of marriage and the family, but that unless you're fighting the underlying conditions, which bind women to the family, to her husband, then you're only fighting a fetish, right? And so that's why we need to always focus on the root of the problem, uh, which is our economic system. Exactly. So- Dead ass. <laughs> Wait, okay, so one more thing. Um, in the last week, there's also been this explosive uh first time ever in history that that population is is in decline. And this is after there has been this conversation about um, you know, there's gonna be a baby boom after COVID. Uh and and simultaneously there are, I think it's New Zealand, I believe, and Australia are incentivizing women, they're paying for women to get their eggs frozen now as some sort of population protection program. How do we feel about this? I mean, on the one hand, part of me thinks that's nice because I'm thinking about freezing my eggs myself right now. And uh, (laughs) I'm just asking. Go to Europe. It's literally like a fifth of the cost in like Spain and Greece. Well, that's throwing that out there. I mean, I've always wanted to go to Greece anyway. So that sounds nice. Um, But like, yeah, I'm just going around asking various family members for money. Luckily, I probably will be able to pay for it. But like, uh, on a grander scale, this seems bad, right? Like, I think we've hit upon one of the core contradictions of capitalism, which is to say, um, you know, capital wants to squeeze the workers as much as it possibly can, but, oh, squeeze them too much and they stop making more workers and they can't stay alive from day to day or generation to generation. And as we know, human labor and the exploitation of human labor is the thing generating all that surplus value, all those nice profits for the bosses. So um, I guess people have tried through various uh, various policies, through various administrations, various places to put in these like stabilizers, these counter tendencies to say, oh wait, we can have capitalism, but it's not allowed to kill everyone because then it won't work anymore. But I think we can all see very obviously capitalism is on fire right now and it is caving in on itself and i don't think these contradictions can be managed anymore by social democratic policies um so this is just one more reason why we need to you know do the thing we need to transform social relations we need to overthrow capitalism we need to build com- build communism and hopefully um the the social reproduction or just like something as personal as having children children will be viewed as a truly personal choice because you feel like doing it, not in terms of economic developmentalism as it is being viewed both here uh, in the social democracies of Europe and in, you know, Matt Iglesias's ridiculous book about how we need a billion Americans. Motherfucker. (laughs) Esperanza. Yeah, I mean, we are in, uh, you know, this decay and decline of capitalism. And so I think it makes sense. I mean, things are very insecure for people right now, economically, uh, mentally, you know, uh, we're fed all of this, uh, you know, constant information about climate change, but we have no revolutionary optimism for how we're going to address it. And, you know, I think it makes sense why, uh, you know, those those numbers are declining. And so I would agree with Jamie that this is even uh, more of a reason that we need to focus on organizing ourselves uh, so that we can transform society. You know, I don't really care that the population is declining. I think great. Um, Fantastic. Also, men should have forced vasectomies. just throwing that out there. I, I got a note from someone today saying that they love our show, but now they're going to have to not be part of Yeah. They're going to um, no longer be patrons because of my forced vasectomy. They thought it was a joke and I'm not kidding. So wow. sorry, sorry, vasectomies are reversible. And, you know, yeah, you may not, it, there's some chances that you might not have be as likely the longer you have it to have a child, but I'm sorry. I've been pumped with hormones since I was 16 years old. Do you think that I'm <laughs> enough? Like, I got a piece of metal shoved up inside me. Exactly. You maybe got a piece of my, yeah. Maybe it's their turn. Anyways, all right, can we just like switch gears just for one second? Because I really do want to talk about this before we wrap the show. Um, we've got a lot of messages from people. So the time is now, we're talking about it. 
Uh, New York City has a mayoral race that's underway. It's a little less than a, a month until the first ranked choice voting mayoral race with all these spectacular candidates. Man, um, it's, a, it's, it's a dumpster fire, fire field. They're like, oh, rank your top five. I don't have any. I'm only typing, I'm only putting in two, by the way, which you can if you're watching, you don't have to rank top five. You can rank two because if you, God forbid, put somebody in fourth that you really don't like, that might boost them up on the 12th round or 11th round. So one of the candidates that I've been pretty quiet on for a lot of reasons, because I don't know, I liked my homework and I didn't want to like, I wanted to be a good ally to people who work with, with her, but now it's all coming out. Uh, Diane Morales. She is, uh, she was positioning herself, and I say that very intentionally, um, as the left candidate with definitely the most uh, left progressive platform, which is one thing. Um, but turns out it took like two minutes and a half for people to realize uh, she didn't even support Cynthia Nixon two years ago. She supported Andrew Cuomo, plus many other things. Um, and turns out her staff uh, was angry about um, not being paid or paid on time, lots of different complaints, and they decided to unionize. Now, I am, before we get to this, because keep in mind, there's two factors here that I do think complicate this, and, and I, it's an important part of this, and I don't even know if the staff understands this. They received matching funds. In matching fund systems in New York, there are very strict rules about employment. They have to get paid. If they sign that contract, they have to get paid. Otherwise, that campaign will get investigated um, for misuse of matching funds. Everything has to be accounted for. There's an audit. It's like a whole process. And then simultaneously, there's a month, not even a month left of the campaign. And so the other question is like, what is the union? How does the unionization work under this complicated system, um, but also with only a month left in the campaign? And so let's let's just show this tweet really quick. And I would love to get your, your responses. Um, because it's not just that they didn't uh, get paid, it's that she was, uh, oh, we don't have the photo of it. Sorry, I thought there was another photo of, they, they protested. Okay, so this is, so they've been terminated. The, the, the folks who've been um, uh, organized the unionization, uh, they were terminated by the campaign. So not the best way to respond. Also, she personally, um, was very aggressive in her response. So Jamie, you're a New Yorker. Let's let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, this is a yikes for me. Uh, <laughs> there's a reason why the New York City DSA took a look at the mayoral race and decided it would not be a good use of our resources to endorse anyone this time around, um, instead focusing on electing socialists to city council, um, especially people who really come out of the work we've been doing at DSA around um, defunding the NYPD by three billion dollars, uh, aka half. That said, you know, I uh, I'm not as wonky as you are, Nomi. Uh, I trust I trust your opinion. I just on ran. That's why I know. That's the only reason. <laughs> but, yeah, but I was ahead. I was like sort of supportive of Morales because I was like, well, you know, she's an NGO CEO, whatever. That makes me look askance at her. But she supports our demand to defund the NYPD. And that's the thing that I care about the most right now. The thing that has been most on my radar. Obviously, this is not good. I don't know who I'm going to freaking vote for uh, besides Paperboy Love Prince, who did oh, uh, recently released a hilarious video response just dunking on uh, Eric Adams, the cop candidate who yeah. did uh, a, a serious video about how basically uh, anything in your house that could have something inside of it or behind it, your kids could be hiding guns and crack pipes there. So uh, Paperboy Love Prince did an amazing video called Eric Adams, Get Out of My Room, which I heartily encourage everyone to watch. And uh, that might be the only candidate that I'm voting for. Interesting. Um, I think I know who I'm voting for, I think. And I might announce it on the show. And I'm, it's not necessarily an endorsement. It's just sort of a thought process thing. But Esperanza, um, you're in Los Angeles. And so I want to I want to pivot this just a little bit because there is a tendency for folks to step up, especially in the last few years, post Bernie uh, 2016, to step up and claim to be progressive in cities where that could really create a lane for them um, or win them in the election. And in a in a race, same thing happens in Los Angeles, very low turnout. So if you can pull a community together, it could actually make a huge difference and win you the election. So how, um, this is a problem. This is happening a lot where there are a lot of people who run as progressives, have progressive platform, and 
either weren't progressive, didn't come from movements at all, and or change or reverse where they stand once they're elected. And I know that's happened in Los Angeles and, and it's been a real issue. How do you think we address this as just collectively, I guess, as a movement? Well, you know, Nomiki, um, I know that we were talking uh, earlier about the USSR, and then we were also talking on our panel today about the need to actually overthrow capitalism and work towards communism. Well, I think that if we're going to think about how we do that, we should look at uh, those who have done it before. And the reality is, is that uh, it was never won through uh, electoral campaigns. It was never won through voting. Um, it was won through a working class party uh, that was able to, uh, you know, actually win through struggle, through revolution. And so I think that we need to actually learn from that rather than repeating the same mistakes over and over again. If you want to enact a couple reforms, milk toast reforms, sure, let's let's run electoral campaigns. But if you're looking to uh, realize a new economic and social system, that's not going to happen from voting people into city council to governor or even to president. And so uh, I think that we need to get serious about what our goal is. And I think that would require us to move beyond these electoral campaigns, uh, which you know, like you said, typically always become a disappointment. So it, let's let's play this out for a second. We have, um, if say it's working class labor aligned um, party or or however you you envision it. So much of oh my god, you know, you're a union member. It's like layers of politics, and I, I mean, how, you need a revolution within unions simultaneously to happen. So how do yeah. you? Uh, <laughs> I say this as, you know, we work, Matriarch is, is a working class labor focused organization of feminists and it's like a lot that needs to be done. So how do you take this revolution to, to labor and then, and then was it a general strike? Like, let's, let's talk this through a little bit. Well, just uh, briefly, you know, I think one of the important things to remember is that like Kwame Ture said, when uh, conditions decline and consciousness rises, that is what makes a revolution possible, a revolutionary period. So uh, conditions are already declining, right? Uh, we see that now, look at with COVID, you know, the, the economic crisis that hit when we still haven't fully recovered from 08. So uh, that's already covered, those objective conditions. But what we can control is the level of consciousness of our people. And how do we do that? We focus on political education, on organizing, uh, organizing ourselves into groups and doing work among the masses in our community. I think that um, electoral campaigns by their very nature, uh, not only are they temporary, not only do they collapse after the candidate is elected, uh, not only are they inherently reformist, uh, we, we need to move beyond that, right? Um, I think eventually that would require the reconstitution of a revolutionary working class party um, but I think in the meantime, it would require deep political education and study of revolutionary theory among the most advanced workers in our union, the most advanced tenants in our neighborhood. And eventually uh, that will plant the seed for us to take back our unions, among other things. What do you think, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, I am sympathetic to this critique that Esperanza is making. Um, I have gone back and forth about this many times myself. And, you know, when I was on the majority report expressing my skepticism of electoral politics as a communist tactic. Now that is different from saying that they're just fucking worthless, right? Like I wanted Bernie to win for very like left liberal social democratic reasons. Cause I want people to have healthcare and that might have helped, but the relationship between that and, you know, the overarching very important project of uh, overthrowing capitalism and unfucking the world and saving the human race, I think is, you know, it's tenuous. I think there might not be any way of knowing what relationship uh, it, it has to it, except, you know, in retrospect, after we, you know, after we do the thing and we're all living in fully automated gay luxury space communism. Um, that said, I do have some thoughts on the party and what a workers party should be and what it should do. 
Um, my caucus that I'm in, uh, DSA Emerge, it's a communist caucus out of New York City, put out a position paper called On the Party Question, the Ballot Line, Third Partyism, and a Fighting DSA, basically describing um, what a workers' party should be and do. Um, and and the, the ballot line question, because people were talking so much about, oh, should we run people as Democrats? Should we run them as independents? Should we not run them at all? Um, just just laying out what a workers party should be. And basically what it is, is an explicitly political body um, that. Right. Because unions aren't necessarily political. Unions could be uh, more more concerned with primarily the economic interests of their workers, of their members, which is, you know, political, but unions also have a lot of conservatives in them. This is an explicitly political body um, that serves to articulate, to, to, to unite the working class in all of these different issues that different people are working on, whether it's immigration justice, racial justice, defunding the police, maybe we'll run some electoral campaigns to support these initiatives, but they always need to be uh, in a support role, not an end in and of themselves, um, to bind these struggles together, to show how they're connected. Um, and the party ideally should be cohering a sort of tactical vision with and as the people doing things on the ground. Um, and I think this is as good an answer as anyone has come up with. Um, I'm less into the idea of the party as a kind of government in waiting. Uh, I tend to be a little more anarchist adjacent where that stuff is concerned. But um, I encourage everyone to check it out because I think it was good. And I think it was a good answer in terms of like the need to not make things about, you know, the individual character of people in office. Like, oh, why is an AOC forcing the vote or whatever? She must be a bad person. No, like these problems are structural. And the thing that will enable people to even have a shot once they get into power as socialists is to have an independent base of working class power that is militant, that is conscious, like we were just talking about, and is independent from the Democratic Party, from the official labor bureaucracy, just a bunch of people who are pissed off and ready to throw down. And that's how we are going to have any hope of doing the thing. Love it. Next time we do this, uh, let's microdose. <laughs> oh. How do you know I Are you down done for that, that already? Uh, you know, I know I, I know the versions of Jamie at this point. A microdose okay. is a subperceptual dose, all right? How do you know if I'm you, not microdosing? If you could perceive it, you're doing it wrong. Fair enough. Although I did tell the story, and I guess I'll tell it again, of micro... Oh, my God, I'm being so open today. Um, microdosing a couple weeks ago on a Sunday. I'll just make sure it's a Sunday so everybody knows. And uh, I got burned on the beach. It was a real serious, I fell asleep, whatever. I'm just gonna tell the story. <laughs> I fell asleep uh, while microdosing. And then I went to go to the pool and I'm sitting in the pool and um, I'm on the phone with my best friend who's absolutely talking to me like I'm a high person. She's like, aha, uh -huh, interesting. So she definitely perceived what was going on. And then a woman walks up to me and says, um, could you please, uh, please get out of the pool for a second? Because I was in the middle of a TikTok and you're now in the shot. So I would really love it if you could get out of the pool. My best friend who lives in Switzerland, who I'm going to raise my children with, and she is like Switzerland, like her personality is Switzerland. She's like, fucking punch her, punch her. I'm like, get out of here. There's a big influencer scene in Puerto Rico right now, which is uh, real fun, real, real, real fun. I was like, oh, man, you're ruining my, get out of my face. Mm -hmm. So yes, that was my, my TikTok influencer mushroom story but next time we'll ma maybe people won't know maybe we will be maybe we won't be let's just coordinate and then tell everybody at the end sounds good are you in on an esperanza <laughs> yeah uh maybe actually i'm i'm mostly sober so okay we don't have there's no pressure this is just sort of a jamie know me thing <laughs> yes. but but um <laughs> but just one one thing i did want to say just really briefly is Please, um sorry. you know i do think that like these questions are hard, right? Uh, but they have been answered, right? Um, they've been answered by, uh, you know, states that have been able to actually crush capitalism and implement socialism. And there's also two of the most advanced revolutions today happening in the Philippines and in India. Um, and we should be learning from them because sometimes in the US we think that uh, we don't have the answer because maybe we don't look outside of our borders. And so I think it's a good opportunity to look them up and study what they're doing too. 
How did they do this? I, right? I think there are there are definitely some good models we could look to who've done uh, it better and ones who've done it worse. Certainly, we're doing. Uh, we're not that advanced yet. The left in the United States, although there are reasons to be hopeful, but like nobody has actually crushed capitalism yet because as long as it exists anywhere in the world, it is everybody's problem. And a lot of these, you know, acts actually existing socialist states. They, they didn't even pretend that they did communism. Like it was right. state capitalism. They were like, we're in a process of social transformation. They tried and they did some really cool shit, but it, it's important to remember no one's actually brought about global communism yet. So, and the, the material conditions are always changing. So I really do think that we need to combine a knowledge of the past with uh, some new approaches because nothing has actually worked yet, right. in my opinion. Uh, well, I mean, I would just say it it's not state capitalism, um, it was socialism. I don't think anyone claimed to, you know, implement communism, uh, but socialism is the transition to communism. And I think we could see both in the USSR as well as pre-1978 China, that is exactly uh, what was happening. To be continued. I was gonna say round two. Jamie's gotta go to, uh, she's got the, the antifadas on going on Twitch right now. It's live right after the show. So you gotta go run over there. Right? That's right. Is that what's happening? Where 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 can they find what's the address on Twitch? Is it just twitch.tv twitch? slash the antifada? And I believe we'll be getting the raid as well, Dorsey. Yeah. Yeah. Also check us out at patreon.com slash the antifada. We put out a free episode and a bonus episode for patrons every week. Uh, nice. being a patron, you can get in our Discord community. They got a really cool reading group going as well as tons of bonus content and it gets you the front of the line if you want to call in on one of our twitch streams we're going to take a bunch of calls today so check us out nice and bye for raid <laughs> raid time all right esperanza thank you for joining us this was such a great conversation we'll continue it i love this panel this is this i look forward to this all week thank you thank you thank you thank you bye friends happy friday bye. happy friday happy friday <laughs> All right, class time. Oh, Kenzo, speaking of, I knew he was in there, uh, says it's about knowing where you can be effective and how you can broker the org's power within the greater politics. Endorsing everyone dilutes our position. Here, here. Joanna H. says it's almost like capitalism deforms healthy social relationships. Huh, yeah, who would have thought? Especially late stage capitalism. Patrick Emmerich says, great to see Kristen on the show today. I took the day off to get my second shot. Nice, so I'm able to watch live. Congratulations, I hope that you have a great recovery that nothing, um, you have no side effects or so minimal. I, is that everybody? Did we get everybody? Oh, Evan says, great guest, great conversation. Thank you. And I think that is everybody. Uh, thank you to everybody in live chats. Thank you to our moderators on Twitch and YouTube. You are the stars, the unseen stars, the unheard stars. We're so grateful to you for keeping these algorithms alive and healthy and the trolls out. And of course, to all of our patrons, we are at even the ones that don't like my vasectomy conversation. Uh, I still love you. And hopefully you can see me beyond my one position on vasectomies, which I believe should be, you know, taken a little bit more seriously. Just, 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 can I, I'll use you. And maybe I'll do an entire open on why vasectomies are the solution to some, if not many of our problems. Uh, I know that our producers here, we had a conversation about it the other day and I've just been surprised how many men were really open to it. So think about it, you know, just, just maybe take the weekend and do some research on it. Um, they're imperfect, but they're gonna get better if more men have vasectomies, if it is normalized. That's how it works. IUDs are so much better. Birth control is so much uh, safer than it used to be. That's how it works, you know? It's capitalism. That's how capitalism works. All right, everybody, we love you and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Stay in solidarity. Oh, and check out the committee program on Monday, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. They are doing incredible work. It's like artistry. They're just on another level. I really don't know any YouTube shows that are like it. So if you haven't checked it out, definitely check it out. It's only getting better. And uh, they have a patron Patreon as well. So go support them on Patreon. Um, and uh, yeah, stay in solidarity. You don't know what your child may be hiding. Could be just a baby doll, but also it could be a place where you can secrete or hide drugs. Something simple as a crack pipe. This one could be hidden inside a pillow. Behind a picture frame, you can find bullets. Eric Adams, get out of my room. What you doing in my room? Eric Adams, get out of my room. 
What you doing in my room, Eric Adams? Get out of my room. What you doing in my room, Eric Adams? Get out of my room. What you doing in my room? What you gonna find in my room? You gonna find love in my room. You gonna find hugs in my room. You gonna find art in my room. You gonna find hugs in my room. You gonna find paper in my room. There ain't no haters up in my room. You gonna find UBI. You gonna find housing for all. Healthcare for all. All up in Paperboy room. All up in room of Paperboy Prince. Uh, why you up in my room searching for Prince? Uh, we spreading love, I'll give you a hint. Paperboy, I'm spreading love. I'm spreading love. I'm spreading love, yeah. Eric Adams, get out of my room. What you doing in my room? Eric Adams, get out of my room. What you doing in my room? Eric Adams, get out of my room. What you doing in my room? Eric Adams, get out of my room. What you doing in my room? We spread in love. We spread in love. Yes.